Thanks for coming along tonight on the occasion of the launch of Mark Tredenic QC's most recent book, Missing, Presumed Dead, the double murder case, uh, the double murder case that shocked Australia. And I should say, before I formally introduce our speaker, that um, the author's proceeds from the publication of this book will be donated to Australian charities that assist and support victims of crime, their families, the families of deceased victims, and the relatives of those who have gone missing. Um, now, I'll introduce our speaker. He's very well known as a barrister and Crown Prosecutor for more than 40 years. Mark Trudenic, QC, has worked, or now KC, has worked on some of Australia's most significant criminal cases. He was Senior Crown Prosecutor in New South Wales for 20 years and President of the Australian Association of Crown Prosecutors. And these days, he's a barrister, he's a photographer, and he's an author, and hence this discussion tonight on missing, presumed dead. Mark Drisky, very welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. My book, Missing, Presumed Dead, is about the disappearance of two women without trace who were victims of a man by the name of Bruce Burrell. Those two women were Dorothy Davis, who disappeared in 1995, and Kerry Whelan, who disappeared in 1997. Those two women were both happy, healthy, mature, middle-class women who rarely go missing for more than a few days and are hardly ever amongst the ranks of those who are never found. Those two victims, Dorothy Davis and Kerry Whelan, were not hitchhikers or associates of drug dealers or unhappy with their lives or suffering from mental health issues. In fact, they fell well outside any of the conventional categories of people who go missing permanently without any trace. They came from completely different parts of Sydney. They mixed in quite different circles. They'd never met each other, and if they had have met, they wouldn't have had that much in common. In fact, they only had one thing in common, and that was that they both knew Bruce Burrell. Dorothy Davis was a 74-year-old widow who lived in Lurline Bay in her own home. She um, was a very happy, healthy woman with children, grandchildren, a very extensive social life. One day in May 1995, she left her home on foot. Thankfully, at the time that she left her home, there was a carpenter who was doing some work on her house. And she said some things to this carpenter that were to prove to be of crucial importance in the later prosecution of Bruce Burrell. And I'll come back to what it was that she said to this carpenter. She left her home on foot, never ever to be seen again. Within a few days, her family realised that she was missing. Uh, they made extensive inquiries. They notified the police. And the police initially thought, oh, this is just a, a woman who's decided to go off on a holiday of her own and not tell her kids and grandkids where she's going. But eventually they realised that she was truly missing. The initial investigation of Dorothy Davis's disappearance by the police was cursory, to say the least. In fact, in many respects, it was deficient. But the police were told by Dorothy Davis's daughter that... Dorothy had lent $100,000 to Bruce Burrell, who was married to a woman called Dallas, who was a very close friend of Dorothy's. And it turned out that Dorothy had made the mistake of demanding the $100,000 that she'd lent to Bruce Burrell back. Now, Bruce Burrell had borrowed money from a number of middle-aged and elderly women, and whenever they asked for the money back, he would threaten them, he'd become intimidatory, he'd use his big physical bulk to intimidate them. But Dorothy Davis was made of sterner stuff, and she announced to Bruce Burrell that if he didn't pay the money back, she'd hand the matter over to her solicitor, and, more importantly, she would tell Dallas, Bruce Burrell's wife, about this loan because she had, she had been um, induced by Bruce Burrell not to tell Dallas about it. 
So the police went and investigated, in a very cursory way, Bruce Burrell. And he told them that he'd been at work on the day of her disappearance. He told them that he'd been at a lunch with his workmates for somebody's birthday. They went and spoke to one of his workmates who said, yeah, I think it was that day that we had the lunch. And, uh, yeah, I think Bruce was at work that day. And that was the end of the investigation. Nothing further happened. Two years later, the second disappearance was that of Kerry Whelan. Kerry was the wife of Bernie Whelan, who was the CEO of the Australian branch of a large multinational company called Crown Equipment that made forklift trucks. He was very wealthy. They lived on a beautiful property, a large property at Currajong, where they uh, ran horses. They had three children together. They were a very loving couple. They had fabulous family life. They had loads of friends. Uh, they had lots of act social activities. And one day in May 1997, Kerry Whelan drove her car to Parramatta and parked in the underground car park of the Park Royal Hotel. Now, Parramatta was the closest large shopping centre to where they lived at Carajong. That hotel had cameras everywhere, including down in the car park. And on the security camera from the hotel, you could see Kerry walking up the ramp from this underground car park to the street, turning right towards the entrance of the hotel and disappearing. She was never, ever seen again. Her body has never been found. Kerry and Bernie were due to go to, on a holiday for a few days uh, that afternoon. When Kerry didn't turn up, Bernie realised something dreadful had happened because there was no way that she would have missed out on this holiday. He reported a missing to the police very quickly and... Uh, got a private inquiry agent to start ringing up hospitals and going to police stations and making every inquiry of every friend that they and relative they ever had to no avail. The next day, the whole family was at their home at Currajong and the mail was delivered and in the mail was a ransom note demanding $1.25 million for Kerry's safe return. Now... Um, it was at that stage that an employed nanny and horse keeper uh, who worked for the Whelans told the police and the family that about three weeks earlier, Kerry had had a very strange visit from a man that she didn't know, a man who just suddenly turned up without any warning, and Kerry had seemed very unease, a, a, a considerable unease with this man. She'd seen them sitting outside on the patio having a cup of tea and talking, and Kerry was upset afterwards. So the police gave her family photo albums to look through, and she looked through album after album after album, and eventually came upon a photograph from a picnic day at Currajong of Crown Equipment employees, and said, that's the man who came to visit Kerry. That man was Bruce Burrell. Bernie then said, well, that's surprising because about a week earlier, out of the blue, my former employee, Bruce Burrell, rang me and I couldn't see what the purpose of the conversation was. It was about nothing. I couldn't work out why he'd rung me after years of having no contact with him. But I did mention that every second Wednesday I go overnight to Adelaide to Crown Equipment's premises in Adelaide. That very next Wednesday was the day that Bruce Burrell turned up at their property and had the conversation with Kerry. So immediately Bruce Burrell became the prime suspect for the disappearance of Kerry Whelan. Now the police went and got the security video from the hotel and they looked at it very closely. So not the officer in charge, but his underlings looked at it very closely and all that they could see was Kerry walking up the car park ramp to the street and disappearing. 
There was another camera that was inside the lobby of the hotel looking out through the main entrance to the street. And you could see that Kerry didn't walk past that main entrance and she didn't go into the hotel. So the police concluded that she must have got into a car between the car park ramp and the main entrance. Now, it was weeks later that the officer in charge of the investigation, not weeks later, about a week later, the officer in charge of the investigation, who really is the hero of this story, Detective Chief Inspector Dennis Bray, decided to have another look at the video himself. And what he saw was that there was a camera on the outside of the hotel pointed in towards a glass door that led to a nightclub of the hotel. And of course, being during the day, the nightclub was in darkness. It was an overcast day. So that glass door acted like a mirror so that you could see in the glass door what was happening out on the street. And what he saw was that 38 seconds after Kerry Whelan had exited that car park ramp, a very distinctive car had taken off from outside the hotel and you could just very vaguely see the outline of a passenger in the front passenger seat. You couldn't see who it was. You couldn't even tell if it was male or female, but there was somebody seated in that seat. Now, that vehicle was a two-door, two-tone, four-wheel drive Pajero with no roof rack, a running board and a very dirty rear windscreen which had been partially wiped by the rear, rear windscreen wiper. So the police immediately went and investigated, does Bruce Burrell have a vehicle like that? No, he didn't. There was nothing registered to his name like that. But he was still the one and only suspect. So the police decided to conduct surveillance of Bruce Burrell, who by this stage was separated from his wife, Dallas. He was living at a very remote property <coughs> near Bungonia, which is in the Southern Highlands, and his ex-wife, Dallas, was still living in their house at Lurline Bay. So the police started conducting this surveillance at Bungonia. Now, I don't know if any of you have been to Bungonia, but it's a very small village, and you can't have a police presence in Bungonia without everybody knowing about it. So immediately everybody thought, oh, the police are trying to look for a marijuana plantation or something like that. But what the police did see was that Bruce Burrell was driving a two-tone, two-door Pajero with a running board, no roof rack and a dirty rear windscreen that had been partially wiped. So they knew they were onto something. So uh, after a, about a week of conducting surveillance of Bruce Burrell, the police decided to conduct a raid of his property at Bungonia. And this raid was very extensive. By this stage, the officer in charge had been informed that two years earlier, Bruce Burrell had been the one and only suspect for the disappearance of another woman, Dorothy Davis. So immediately, this became an investigation of two murders. And Detective Chief Inspector Bray immediately set in train inquiries that should have been conducted two years earlier but hadn't been. For a start, he got uh, the telephone records of Bruce Burrell and discovered that he hadn't been at work that day, but that about an hour after Dorothy Davis had left her home on foot, Bruce Burrell had driven from his home at Lurline Bay, which was literally around the block from where Dorothy Davis lived, and had driven down to the Bungonia property, which is about a two-hour trip, spent an hour there and driven all the way back in the same day. The very next day, he'd done exactly the same. Two hours down, about two hours there, and then two hours back. So that immediately raised a lot of suspicions. Now, what did the police find at the Bungonia property? Well, they were primarily looking for bodies. And that property and the surrounding national parks in that area were dotted with old shale mines 
and ventilation shafts from decades and decades past that were no longer, hadn't been used for a long, long time and were in shocking condition. They literally lowered police down some of them that were more safe, uh, but some of them they had to lower cameras down because it was just too unsafe to lower somebody down. They didn't find any bodies. But what they did find at Bruce Burrell's home was absolutely fascinating. On a desk in his lounge room, there was a pile of papers, maybe this high. They took possession of those papers, took them back to the police station, and in due course, two police officers had the, the um, task of going through those papers. And what they found were a number of dot point notes. Now, a dot point note is when someone has written in their own handwriting, dot, and then some words, dot, then some words. There was one dot point note that was an early version of the kidnapping. There was another dot point note that was an early version of the ransom note. There was another dot point note about cleaning a vehicle. And in particular, it said, front passenger side, half an hour. Now, I'm sure all of you at some stage of your lives have washed a car, but have you focused for half an hour on the front passenger side? I haven't. But I can think of a good reason why somebody might want to focus on the front passenger side of a vehicle if they wanted to get rid of any fingerprints or DNA from somebody in relation to whom they would have no explanation for the presence of that person in the car. They also found uh, a note in which Burrell had written down $68,000 worth of improvements that he wanted to do to his property at Hillydale. Now, the motive for Bruce Burrell's actions in kidnapping Kerry Whelan was that he was in such dire financial straits that he couldn't even pay the interest that was due on the bank mortgage over Hillydale and he was at, at risk of losing Hillydale. The obvious motive for Dorothy Davis's disappearance was that he had spent the $100,000 that she'd lent him. She was demanding it back. She was threatening him with action and even more significantly with the shame of telling his wife that this elderly woman had been prevailed upon to lend him money um, and he had no way of paying it back. He'd already spent that $100,000. So it was purely financial motive, purely greed. Um, so he, he was certainly in no position to spend $68,000 improving Hillida. They also found on this property an almost empty bottle of chloroform. Now... When Burrell was asked, why did he have chloroform? He said, oh, he bought it to use as a cleaning agent. Now, again, I don't know about you. I've done occasional cleaning from time to time, but I've never had any need for chloroform. <laughs> they also found a street directory and when I'm addressing younger audiences about this, I've got to explain to them what a street directory is, <laughs> where the location of the Park Royal Hotel in Parramatta was highlighted in pink highlighter and the address of the hotel was written in the margin. And then leading away from that location was a route along various roads towards the premises of Crown Equipment, but stopping a couple of kilometres before it at a place where at that time, the time of <coughs> Kerry Whelan's disappearance, it was a straight stretch of road where you could see about a kilometre in either direction. There were no houses, no shops, no factories, nobody to oversee what was happening. So an ideal location to convert a voluntary lift, because Kerry Whelan undoubtedly voluntarily got into that car, 
place to convert a voluntary lift into a forced abduction. Uh, Bruce Burrell was so overwhelmed by the presence of this large contingent of police at his property and, perhaps more significantly, a large contingent of media people camped at the front gate of this property, that in desperation he managed to find his way without being followed by police to Goulburn, where he went to a public phone box thinking that you can't trace calls from public phone boxes, made a call to the reception desk at Crown Equipment and said, tell, he gave a code that was in the ransom note so that Bernie would know it was the real kidnapper. He said, tell Bernie that if he ever wants to see Kerry alive again, to call off the police. When he was asked questions about that call by the police a few days later, he thought maybe he had been followed and he thought, if I lie about this, that's going to be evidence against me. So he admitted being in that phone box at that time, but claimed that he was ringing his solicitor, not ringing Crown Equipment. We could prove from phone records that did exist that the call at that time was to Crown Equipment and not to his solicitor. So um, a decision was made for the Kerry Whelan murder to, uh, for, for Bruce Barrell to be charged. It went to a pre-trial hearing. The trial judge who was allocated excluded quite a bit of the evidence that I've told you about, including the chloroform, the parts of the street directory other than the location of the Park Royal Hotel, the dot point note about car cleaning, the, dot point, uh, the uh, list of improvements to Hillydale, but allowed in the other two dot point notes. And I can't tell you why, because it's confidential, but I can legitimately say that the Director of Public Prosecutions announced that the prosecution of Bruce Burrell would be discontinued for lack of evidence. Chief Inspector Bray then took the matter to the coroner. And the coroner held a joint coronial inquest into both deaths and Bruce Burrell was required to appear because he was served with a subpoena, but he exercised his right not to answer questions on the grounds that the answer might tend to incriminate him. The counsel assisting the coroner asked him some lovely questions. What, are you responsible for the death of Kerry Whelan? I declined to answer that question. Are you responsible for the death of Dorothy Davis? I declined to answer that question. Are you a predator of women? I decline to answer that question. 84 questions that he declined to answer. And there was a tiny little bit of evidence that came forward that hadn't been available previously. And armed with that, the coroner said that he was satisfied that a known person, guess who, was responsible for both deaths and he wrote a letter to the DPP. The D By that stage, I had become available because I was unavailable previously because I was doing another trial and the matter came to me and again, I can't tell you why because it's confidential information, privileged information, but the DPP announced that Bruce Burrell would in fact go to trial on both matters, the Kerry Whelan disappearance and the Dorothy Davis disappearance, both murders. I then made an application to a new trial judge to have both matters dealt with together. And I drew the trial judge's attention to the similarities between the two matters, but I also called a police officer from the missing persons section of the New South Wales Police. And I said, look, during those three years that these two women went missing, during those three years, how many people were reported missing? And the answer was about 21,000. And then six years later, which is when I made the application, how many of them were still missing? Bodies never found. Women of mature age who were not hitchhikers, not suffering from mental health issues, 
uh, not dealing in drugs, not any of those categories of people who sometimes go missing, not wanting to change their lives because they were desperately unhappy, all of those categories. How many, excluding those categories, are still missing six years later? And how many do you think there were? Two. <laughs> what were their names? <laughs> Kerry Whelan and Dorothy Dokes. So I thought that was really significant. And I had to show some significant probative value to make the two matters interchangeable at the same trial. <coughs> Unfortunately, the trial judge didn't agree with me and ruled that I had to go to trial on each matter individually. So we made a decision to go to trial first in relation to the disappearance of Kerry Whelan because it was a stronger case in a way. We went to trial. The trial took about three months. Um, and at the end of the three-month trial, the jury were unable to agree. The judge discharged them. A day later, most of the jurors went to the Sydney Morning Herald to report that the, well, there was one juror who was holding out, who was bizarre from the very first day, who refused to engage in discussions with them and who was just bizarre. So the New South Wales government, because of that, this case, went and passed new legislation to allow for majority verdicts of 11 to 1. So you can have one person holding out and you can still get a verdict either way, for guilty or not guilty. So we went to trial again. <laughs> again, three months of evidence, the same evidence. And this time the jury were able to agree and deliver a verdict and Bruce Burrell was convicted of the disappearance of the murder of Kerry Whelan and was sentenced to life imprisonment. We then went to trial in relation to the Dorothy Davis matter. And I'll tell you what the evidence was that the carpenter gave. The carpenter said that as, Dorothy, as um, Dorothy Davis was leaving her home on foot, she pointed in the direction of where the, the sea was, which was only a block away, and said, I'm going to visit a friend who's had cancer. She had chemotherapy. She lost all of her hair. But she's well now, she got her hair back and she's really well and has recovered. And we could prove that the only person that she knew in that whole suburb who fitted that description was Dallas Burrell, Bruce Burrell's wife. So Dorothy was clearly leaving her home to go thinking that she was going to meet up with Dallas. But in fact, Dallas was at work that day. We called her to give evidence. And the only one who was at home was Bruce Burrell, who an hour later left his home, drove down to Bungonia, obviously giving him an opportunity to temporarily dispose of the body and then going back the next day to dispose of it permanently. Uh, so after another lengthy three-month trial, Bruce Burrell was convicted of the murder of Dorothy Davis and was sentenced, surprisingly, to 28 years which, of course, was purely academic because he'd already received a life sentence. Just two short further facts. The first one is the police conducted two extensive searches of Bruce Burrell's property and the neighbouring national park looking for bodies never, never managed to find them. And the last thing that I mention is that... Um, ..after his conviction and after all of his appeals had been exhausted, the police approached Bruce Burrell in jail trying to convince him to disclose the whereabouts of the bodies. He, has, he always refused to admit responsibility for the deaths, never disclosed anything about the location of the bodies. And in my book, I, I advance some reasons why people in his situation maintain their innocence. And there are some very, very strong reasons why, particularly for somebody like Bruce Burrell, who had very severe narcissistic traits and serving a life sentence, his life is almost totally outside his control. This is the one area where he still has some control. So having said all that, I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. So, um, Quite an achievement. Uh, the suggestion was 30 minutes and...
without reading from a note you write on 30 minutes. So very impressive, I'd have to say. Um, so as I said, copies of the book, I'm sure Mark will be happy to sign them after. Any proceeds go to uh, the good cause of um, victims and families of victims uh, of crime. Uh, just come back and just talk to the end of the room. So tell us a bit, you, you touched a bit on, um, on the murderer briefly. So tell us, I mean, he dies in prison. But apart from saying a narcissist, I mean, what, what sort of a person was he? What was his background? Did he have any other crimes apart from these two murders? And then he dies, and what does he die of? Just take us from the beginning to the end of Burrell's life. Uh, he was born into a perfectly conventional family. His father was a wool classer in Goulburn. Uh, very solid, stable family life. But Bruce, from a very early age, showed signs of believing that the universe owed him a living. Uh, as, a, as a teenager, he got his first job in a bank, lasted a few weeks, stole some checks, and uh, his father had to do a deal with the bank to pay the money back so that the police weren't called. That was the start of his life of crime. He, um, he had this belief that if he wanted a car, he wouldn't be so stupid as to go and buy one. He'd go to a car yard, ask to go for a test drive, with, with a, an employee of the car yard and then stop at a shopping centre and say, oh, look, there, there's a package waiting for me in one of those shops. Would you go and pick it up for me? And the employee would go, no package for Bruce Burrell, come outside, no car. And there were two vehicles on his property at Bungonia when, when the police raided it that he acquired in that way. He uh, was a classic narcissist. He knew how to ingratiate himself to people. He could be very nice and charming and charismatic, but he could also be very threatening. Um, he had this belief that he was of superior ability and he could anticipate problems that might arise during the course of his criminal activities, but he was totally unrealistic in that belief. I mean, the fact that he r rang Bernie, uh, uh, Bernie mm -hmm. Whelan and then went and actually visited Kerry Whelan three weeks before she'd kidnapped, ensured that he was leaving trace evidence for the police to find later on and that, and that he would become the prime suspect. And he was totally oblivious of that. But having said that, if he, didn't, if he hadn't have murdered Kerry Whelan, he would have got away with the murder of Dorothy Davis. And in the book... There's another very mysterious disappearance associated with Bruce Burrell of another neighbour in Lurline Bay, a man by the name of Charlie Spears, who, again, disappeared off the face of the earth without trace. There was never any evidence to implicate Bruce Burrell, but a strong suspicion of it. So it may well be that one of the reasons why he didn't disclose where the bodies were was that there were three bodies there, not just two. And his demise? His demise was in jail about oh, six, five, six years ago. Um, he, he was very unhealthy. He was very overweight. He was very unfit. Um, and uh, is, as I said earlier, he, he died without disclosing or admitting anything. At the age of, what, 62? About that, yes. Yes. Right, so there's a question here. Then we've got one here. Yeah. Uh, what sort of Hang thing? On. No, we're not here. No, we're not. Okay, we're going. He's got to talk. Right. Well, what sort of thing, Mark? Do you think uh, Bruce would have said to Kerry to induce her to come down in such a hurry to Parramatta? And what did he? Why did he worry her when he met her at her house? It's a very good question. And it, at the end of the trial, it was one of those enduring mysteries that we had no evidence about. Um, as a prosecutor, of course, you can't engage in speculation and conjecture. But as a writer of uh, crime nonfiction, one can engage in that sort of conjecture. And in the book, I suggest what he may have said to Kerry that would have induced her not only to come to Parramatta and get into his car, but not to tell anybody, including her husband, what she was doing. Clearly, from where that highlighting went, I think, it's, I think it's abundantly clear that they were driving towards Crown Equipment and she thought they were going to go and see Bernie. 
Um, and he stopped before getting there at a place where he could convert that voluntary lift into a forced abduction. But I have to tell you that I, I've given lots of talks at libraries and bookshops and community groups, and I inevitably have somebody who's read the book who says to me, I don't think your explanation for what he said to Kerry is right. I've got a better explanation. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it is conjecture. Yeah. Question here. Okay, I think that was my first question. My next question is, why would someone lend a hundred thousand dollars to? to um... Dorothy Davis had known Dallas Burrell all her life. Loved her dearly. Dallas had been very unwell, had had cancer. And Bruce preyed upon her to lend in the money as a deposit for another house that would assist in Dallas's recovery. So he preyed upon um, Dorothy's love for his, for his wife and her, her feelings about uh, Dallas having been so ill. He knew exactly how to get the money out of her. Question, Nancy? Yeah, hang on. Uh, the, the Burrell case, and, the Burrell case, and very recently the Dawson case, um, are circum, circumstantial cases where there's no murder. Um, can you put on your no, no body? Sorry, no, no body. Can you put on your prosecutor's hat and just tell us the the difficulties of prosecuting a murder without a body? Um, a lot of people make the mistake of thinking that a circumstantial case is necessarily weaker than a direct evidence case. Nothing could be further from the truth. You can have really strong circumstantial cases where each piece of evidence is like a piece of a jigsaw puzzle and as a prosecutor you're helping the jury to put the pieces together and at the end of the day there might be some pieces missing but boy you can still see the picture. Now one of the things that you have to prove in a murder trial is death. If you have a body, it's obviously very easy to prove death. But there are other ways of proving death, particularly with an adult who has family life, lots of friends, lots of activities planned for the future, bank accounts, Medicare cards, doctors, and the like. And if you can prove that from one day to the next that person has not had any contact with anybody, has not had any access to any of those services, it's not difficult to prove death. Uh, you mentioned uh, Burrell wouldn't uh, release any information. It reminds me of Ivan Milat, a very similar case. He's almost certainly responsible for more murders, but it's his controlling way that he refused to um, um, put the families at rest, you know, who've lost uh, loved ones. Look, um, it's not just having control. There's another reason that I explore in the book. And that is, um, if you've been sentenced to jail for life or for a very long period, there might be only two or three people on the outside who still support you. The support of those people on the outside is of critical importance if you're locked up for a lengthy period or for life. And I think that often it's to maintain credibility with those few people who still support you when you're in jail that is the reason why people like Ivan Milat and like Bruce Burrell don't admit their guilt and don't disclose the whereabouts of the bodies. Um, in fact, I, I did a case of a young man who was sentenced to life who had one person on the outside who still believed in him, in him and who maintained his innocence just to maintain credibility with that one person. Um, in both the Dawson case yes. and this case, there's obviously been a stuff up with the police, more so with Dawson, no doubt. Um, there was one policeman, obviously, that you say is a hero in it all. Uh, it's a huge job to decide when something should really be pursued forensically. We watch our murder mysteries and they always do pursue them forensically. But tell us a bit about the way the police handle these cases. Is it because they just think, oh, well, 
it's too hard? I mean, what what was the motivation or this? What was the flaws in the police case and how did they crack it? I, I don't think it's because it's too hard. Initially, I think it's understandable that the police think, well, we can't know that this person has been forcibly detained. They may have just decided to make themselves scarce. Um, they may have gone off and not told their relatives. So initially, the police reaction might be inadequate. But subsequently, um, after <coughs> that, it, it depends to some extent on who's doing the investigation. If it's the, the local suburban police who are doing it, you're not going to get nearly as good a job as if you get the homicide squad involved. And the other thing that should be said is that with the disappearance of Kerry Whelan, when that ransom note was received a day later and it was clearly a real ransom demand, I mean, kidnapping for ransom is so unusual in Australia, thank goodness, and may it always be so, so it, it immediately attracted an enormous police um, presence to investigate the disappearance, to try and explore ways of getting Kerry back safely, uh, to try and keep Bernie Whelan safe because there was some risk that he might be harmed. Um, they had numerous people who pretended to be the kidnappers, so their, their job was also to try and sort out the fraudsters from the real kidnapper. Uh, and of course, the huge investigation in Bruce Burrell when the information became known about him. Just to give you an idea of the extent of the investigation into Kerry Whelan's disappearance, when the police realised that this vehicle that can be seen in the glass door of the hotel was a particular type of Pajero, they made the decision to conduct uh, a search for every single owner of that kind of vehicle throughout New South Wales. And there were thousands and thousands of them. They managed to get to all but six or seven to ask them, you know, were, did you happen to be in Phillip Street, Parramatta on that particular day with the view in mind that if we can show that they were not, then that only leaves one vehicle and that's Bruce Burrell's vehicle. Um, there were six or seven they couldn't find because either people had died or they'd gone overseas. But you can imagine the extent of that investigation, what it would require. There'd been nothing done like that since the kidnapping murder of uh, the boy in 1960, that, um, of Graham Thorne, that my, my book Kidnapped is about. They did a very similar exercise. At that stage, of course, it was not computerised. It was all in, in cards at the, what was then the Department of Motor Transport. Uh, back in 1997, it was um, much easier because it was electronic, but they still had to go and find all these people, interview them, and uh, so it was a mammoth exercise. You got the question if you got the microphone. Okay, yeah. Like an ice cream. Yes, um, Mark. <laughs> I wanted to just ask you about your um, views of judge alone trials versus uh, jury trials because I take it both of these cases were jury verdicts. Both jury trials, yes. And the Dawson case was a judge alone trial. Yes. What do you think about the two um, types of uh, proceeding and, and do you have a preference as to which one you prefer to appear in? And now, are you asking for my preference as a former prosecutor <laughs> or as a current defence barrister? <laughs> <laughs> well, you can you can you can talk to it from both points of view, I suppose. No, I, I'm a, as a citizen, I'm a great supporter of the jury system. I think it's got a lot going for it. It is slowly being whittled away in two ways. Firstly, by judge alone trials, but also. Um, Every time they amend the law in relation to which matters go to the local court, which of course is heard by a magistrate, and which matters go to trial, to a jury trial in the district court or the Supreme Court, it's always the local court that's getting more and more matters. So you're getting single magistrates in the local court deciding cases that once upon a time would have gone to a jury trial. Look. I think there is a real place for trial by judge alone because it can avoid 
the sort of prejudice that you get in some cases. And the Dawson case is a classic example. How are you going to find 12 jurors who haven't seen the podcast and who don't know anything about the case? So it's a way of having a fairer trial without running that risk of of prejudice. Um, Sometimes I've, on behalf of a client, I've elected to have a trial by judge alone because of some uh, background or ethnicity of the client that I feel might create some prejudice amongst ordinary jurors, but hopefully judges don't have that, those prejudices. Um, so th- there are a whole host of reasons why you might do that. When the system of trial by judge line first started, the judges had a higher acquittal rate. They've now done some comparisons and, and it's now very similar. The conviction rates are very similar between jury trials and judge alone trials. So I, th- I think it's now an accepted part of our system and it's working well. Okay. I, I, just, I was just going to, I was just going to, add, I, was just going to add, I was just going to add, my dad was one of the people, we lived in Bondi at the time of the Graham Thorn incident and my dad had a Ford custom line at the time and he was interviewed by the police. And secondly, nothing to do with that. Uh, with the Dawson case, who, if he's appealed, who decides whether his appeal is going to go ahead? Like Everybody's entitled to appeal. So anybody who wants an appeal gets an appeal. Whether it's successful or not remains to be seen. That's up to the three appeal judges in the Court of Criminal Appeal. Three judges. Three judges. And then after that, there's the possibility of an application for a further appeal to the High Court in Canberra. But that requires the consent of the High Court for the appeal to go ahead. And many of the appeals don't get the leave that's required to go to the High Court. But just going back to the Ford custom line in the uh, Graham Graham Thorne disappearance, Stephen Bradley, who was the kidnapper and murderer, was one of the owners of a custom line who was interviewed by the police. The police assumed nobody would be so stupid as to use their own car. Mm. We're looking for a car that's been stolen or borrowed by the kidnapper. And when Stephen Bradley said, no, my car was in the garage that day, it hasn't been stolen, hasn't been lent to anybody, they just ticked him off the list and that was the end of that. It wasn't until much later that he became the focus. Looking, check my phone in a second. Burrell's wife, Dallas, gave evidence. That's is that compulsory, or did she volunteer? And what did she say? And how did that end up? Um, look, uh, uh, she was a, a cooperative witness. Uh, by the time of the trial, they'd been well and truly divorced for many years. Um, as such. She was not entitled to refuse to give evidence. A a, a wife is entitled to make an application to the court to be excused from giving evidence, but um, and certain other relatives too. Um, But but there was no question of her not wanting to give evidence. And and all she gave evidence about was um, fairly innocuous stuff um, about not being at home, being at work on the day of Dorothy's disappearance, uh, about phone calls that she had with Bruce when he arrived at Bungonia that night and his trip back and then further further calls between them on Burrell's mobile phone subsequently. I should also add that another investigation that Chief Inspector Bray organised two years later was to get the credit card records for the birthday party that had supposedly been held for Bruce Burrell's workmates, only to find, of course, it was not on that day, it was on another day. (laughs) Thank you for a gripping and fascinating uh, uh, presentation. What is it about crime that makes it so endlessly fascinating to everybody? (laughs) Uh, Well, it's about the human condition, isn't it? Um, You know, what, what, what what do preschool kids talk about? Who's being naughty in the playground? 
um, it's not much different, our fascination for crime. It's people doing the wrong thing, people breaking the rules, people doing extraordinary things, trying to understand how do people get themselves into those situations. And also, um, deep down, uh, are we capable of doing things like that? Um, if we were in a similar predicament, what would we do? Uh, so I think there's an endless fascination with crime for all those reasons. Let's take you for a moment to um, the issue you said you didn't want to discuss or you couldn't discuss, the role of the Director of Public Prosecutions. Now, this is often very controversial, isn't it? Because DPPs, in a number of cases, decide they won't prosecute when magistrates and others believe that they should have but this becomes completely secret and we never really know why these decisions are made, whereas if cases go before magistrates or courts, we get an idea one way or the other. What can you say about the role of the DPP? Because it also came up in the Dawson case, as you know. Yes, yes. Um, look, the decision by the DPP is an administrative decision, not a judicial decision, so it doesn't have the same repercussions as a decision of a court. The DPP announces publicly his decisions and he will often, he or she, will often uh, give very brief reasons, like the, the evidence was inadequate. The ultimate test is, is there a reasonable prospect of conviction? And Nicholas Cowdery has been interviewed publicly about his previous decisions not to prosecute Chris Dawson and basically he has said, look, I announced that, that that was the case. Had it been otherwise, and this is, this is Nicholas Cowdery in public, had it been otherwise, he may well have been acquitted and the court wouldn't have had the benefit of the evidence that was available in 2022. So it, you don't want to prosecute too easily and too early because of the possibility of further evidence becoming available and making a much stronger prosecution case. Okay, we're, getting, we're getting close to the end. I'm fascinated by how much the prosecution in your case, in this case, becomes the detective. I watch too many things on television, I think. But as you were speaking, it became clear to me, and I think there's an element of this in the trial at the moment, the rape case in Canberra, no, where no. the actual the actual people who are involved in the trial, in order to put the case together, do their own kind of sifting through the evidence or even finding people who might add to the evidence. To what extent did you have to do some of that? As a prosecutor, we don't do our own investigations, obviously, but occasionally we will request further investigations by the police if we feel there's some area that's lacking, some loose end that hasn't been followed up, we will sometimes say to the police, would you please go and investigate this? Um, but uh, ultimately, the way you structure a case at trial is up to the individual prosecutor. And sometimes it will accord with the views of the police. Uh, occasionally it doesn't. It might be different in some respects. But as a prosecutor, yes, you formulate the way you structure your own case. That's not being an investigator. It's being, it's really conducting an analysis. And particularly in regard to what alleged motive you're suggesting the accused had. Sometimes um, you, you might have some ideas that uh, the police haven't come up with that emerge from the evidence. But you've got to be very, very careful because any submission that you make to the jury about any part of the case has to be based on the evidence. And you, you run the risk if you come up with theories that are not based on evidence of the, the judge slapping you down and saying, Mr Crown, I'm not going to permit you to make that submission because it's not based on the evidence. It's happened to me once or twice. Um, and so over the years, I've learned to be very careful about that. Um, but, yeah, it, it is, it's sometimes difficult because 
juries are allowed to draw reasonable inferences, but they're not allowed to engage in conjecture. What's the difference between an inference and conjecture? Sometimes it's very obvious, but sometimes it can be very difficult. So, uh, thanks to uh, Mark Tedeschi for a fascinating account of two very sad cases, two very serious murders that are in, in relatively recent times, and some of us will remember them. Uh, but I think this is now your uh, third book and fourth. fourth book in crime nonfiction. And I'm um, sure there'll be some more because you've produced them pretty quickly and they're very readable. So I'm sure our author tonight will be happy to sign copies of the book. But for now, congratulations and good luck. Thank you very much.